Hello, I'm Robin Lynn Maven, the CEO, creator, and producer of Vibes Live. We have over 2 million geographical listeners reaching 200 countries with nonstop music 24 7. Just tune in on VibesLive.com. <laughs> So nice, so that's what I like. I said it here. How you just don't stop it and just get ready to jam. With Disco Daddy Wide World of Hip Hop Radio Show. Every Saturday at 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Only on VibeLive.com. With special guests every week. Don't miss it. <laughs> Hello out there, Disco Daddy's here. <laughs> Welcome to Disco Daddy's Wide World of Hip Hop. And today I'm sitting here with my producer, um, helping me on this show. And uh, this is our debut show, our premiere actually. And uh, I'm honored to have uh, Robin Lynn Macon here uh, assisting me with this and showing me all the fine points of internet radio broadcasting, which is a new field for me. And I am honored to have her brother, <laughs> DJ Antron Maven, on the I'm other end honored. of this microphone. I am really honored, my brother. <laughs> You're one of the few people who go way back to the early days of Rappers Rap Records who know anything about the history. Um, and I'm going to sit back. We call him DJ Antron, y'all, okay, because that's what he's affectionately known as, that's what how he earned his professional name here on the Wheels of Steel. And uh, we're going to let you tell him uh, about yourself, my brother. And uh, then we're going to go into a little history of the West Coast scene that both you and I know back and forth and stuff. So, Anthony Antron Maven. Yeah, that's right. Welcome um, to Disco Daddy's Wired World of Hip Hop. What's up, my brother? History goes back to, I was actually on the Greyhound bus on my way to Los Angeles for the first time when I heard Disco Daddy on the radio. I had my headphones on. It had to be 1981, right? Right, that. I said that. Okay, okay. I, okay. I was in high school. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm on my way, and Rapper's Rap was my life. Mm. So, so I moved to L.A., and I got into the hip-hop scene, and I met Duffy, and he became my first manager, and I became a... a recording engineer, and I met everybody. Duffy Rooks, who was the founder of Rapid Rap Records. Oh, yeah, he was my manager. Right. Uh, okay, let, let me uh, ask you, though. What, what made you decide to come to L.A. in the first place? Why were you on that Greyhound bus? What was the first initial motivation to move from what, San Diego? Was it San Diego? Yeah, my father snatched me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he took me out meaning, of meaning, he, Meaning what? I, he I, had something I, going on here? They bought you in on it? I couldn't stay in San Diego anymore. I was too much. So my father said, I got to take him. So mm -hmm. it, it, okay. starting in high school, my right. father took me and moved me to L.A. Gotcha. And, and he was already a musician um, mm. from Seattle and in lots of bands. And there's a lot of history there we don't have to talk about. But... Right, right. But he set me up with all the equipment I needed that I would play around with the music. So I'm not just a DJ. I'm a musicologist. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. about the music, the sound, the style. I would study the music. I would write the music. Plus, I'm a drummer. I'm a musician. Right. Oh, and, um, I didn't know that. And... It, my father was an audiophile. What that means is he had all the best equipment. <clears throat> so I would, like, really listen to, to the sound quality, the fidelity. And, you know, he had yeah. albums and record pulls. He's got everything. So I'm just playing around with his equipment when he's gone. Right. Hmm. So in high school, I was the most qualified, the most advanced. So I just took over. And this is South Los Angeles. 
<laughs> now, that's interesting. But I think when you get here, exactly what goes on, because you're also a part of a very special institution known as Radio and then Radio, later Radio Tron. So tell us a little bit how you fell into that, how you got it, because you got to meet some very interesting people at the outset of the dawn of West Coast hip hop. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Radiotron, I was looking for. I couldn't find it at first, uh, mm -hmm. back when the glove was there. So I, mm -hmm. I always give the glove credit. Uh, I didn't find it when he was there, but then um, radio station K Day had a ad. He said DJ contest. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so I just went to that. That's mm -hmm. it. I went K Day said mm -hmm. DJ contest. And we caravan to the Radiotron, and I already, um, I already made a record before that called Scratchmatic, Sound of the Street, on some record. Okay. Yeah, so, so I had a following, so when I right. came in there, I just swept it. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, wow. And a DJ battle, and it was mostly about the crowd. It, it, was, the ju it was judged by the crowd. Okay. And I'll tell you the secret, the girls. <laughs> Of course, the girls are speaking to everything. <laughs> yeah. No, I, mean, they, they, I used to go there. I know they had some fantastic females there. They did for me. That's so funny. I saw it. Because <laughs> uh, my best friend, um, my number two, he said, you cheated. He said, oh, you just won because you had the crowd. And I said, isn't that <laughs> how you win? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You rubbed shoulders at the beginning of your career with other people at the beginning of their careers at the radio? Because you want to drop some names on us, my brother, so people see how deep it, it, uh, you go in this uh, West Coast uh, hip-hop scene? Of course. I was a battle DJ, which means I didn't make friends. I made enemies. Mm -hmm. I went straight through. All right. I'll drop the mm -hmm. top one. Okay. Face-to-face -face mm -hmm. this fight with Ice T. Righteous. Okay, um, I didn't fight Dr. Dre because I was tired. I just said, I don't need any more enemies for some reason. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't fight with Dr. Dre because I just was, I was done. Kid right. Frost was my ally, but anybody else, it was no prisoners. Hmm. Okay. Um, you knew Chris Love Taylor? I did not. I did not. You didn't meet Chris? You, did Chris come in after you left? No, he was before me. Oh, he was before you. Oh, okay, I got you. All right, never he knew was that. Before me. Okay. Okay. Now, now Egypt, I would say mm -hmm. he's my teacher. Egypt. I would Okay, both of them are on this show too with you. He he he's my god. Mm -hmm. uh, I would I could never diss Egypt. I could never diss uh, the club. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was supposed okay. to be in the group two live crew, but I turned them down. Mm. They're from San Bernardino, by the way. Because remember, I'm with Duffy. Right. I'm working at a label. I got a club. I had my own right. shit going on. Oh, right. I cursed. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. <laughs> but you, you would have had to go to Florida to work with them. Well, or were you that's working right. two live crew? Was based out here for a minute though. At He's from time, San Bernardino. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's from San Bernardino. He moved to Florida oh. to live with his grandmother. I knew him before oh, okay. he moved to, San, to Florida. Okay, I didn't know that either. Good enough. See, you dropping bombs already, my brother. We only 15 minutes <laughs> into this show. <laughs> DJ Antron of Disco Daddy's White World of Hip Hop. Continue, my brother. I'm sorry. Let's we see going into the okay, early uh, days. Let's go. Rap is rap label. How did you meet Duffy? Okay, the same day. Well, Arabian Prince used to come to my high school, and Arabian taught me a lot in the early days. Mm. Um, he used to come. And um, mm. I, I met mm. Duff, like you said, I, at a K-Day street scene. I was trying okay. to think of the name. Um, DJ and It might have been the L.A. street scene. Was it downtown L.A., around the uh, city hall? Yeah, and, and Techno Hop was there, uh, DJ and Okay. Okay, that was the L.A. street scene given by Tom Bradley. K. They did have a stage there. I handled the hip-hop stage for the street scene. I remember that very well. You are the godfather of Los Angeles. 
Oh, well, that's all right. That's all right, my brother. But you started working with Duffy, and I appreciate you. But you started working with Duffy and his father, and you took part in uh, the uh, production of, or the mixing or engineering of some of Duffy's records. You want to name some of those? Uh, because they're classic joints. Well, I was I was recording engineer, and there were so many songs, some released, some not. I don't I don't know. Right. Um, at the time, we were at Liam Haywood Studio, okay. and they they were finishing um, Batter Ram. Mm, Batter Ram. Leon Haywood, you guys out there may not know this. He produced She's a Bad Man, a Jammer for Carl Carlton. So that's who and I was at his studio too. With. Okay, there you go. DJ Antron was in the mix with all of this stuff was going down. Very lively LA scene. Very fertile period in hip-hop in Los Angeles, and you, all of a sudden, you're right smack dab in the middle of it. Did you have any sense at that time <laughs> that you were right smack dab in the middle of a lot of history, or were you just out there on the ground? I was a puppy. Looking back. Nope. I was a baby. I was a puppy. Mm. Mm. I was just coming into the game and growing and learning. I mean, I wasn't ready to fight Ice Peak. Face to face, he's eight years older than me, and he want to fist fight me, and I was like, "What?" What was, what was that? I'm gonna take you off subject. What, do you want to talk about that? Because it's it's old, but it's interesting. You know, it illuminates a part of the history. Like I said, people don't know about. That's why we have this show. What what was that about? You might have to go in it, deep into it. But what happened exactly? That's because we're from different crews and different cliques, and and when you're a battle, you just get into battles and some shit. And and I'm not gonna say exactly why because <laughs> right right <laughs> you don't have to go into it but because you know <laughs> but right 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 right, right. Uh, I just want to know was it resolved and years later have you had a chance to, to see the brother again and uh, I think, was I think it did it actually get into a fist fight and who won <laughs> Africa Islam broke up our fight and Africa Islam broke it up okay. Okay. Right. There was no, no, nobody hit, nobody was hit. You know what I'm saying? Oh, okay, okay. It was word, and then word. started, and they broke right. us up. Um, okay. QD3, Quincy Jones III, he, he settled all beefs. There's no beefs anymore in L.A., not through us. Okay, beautiful. So, beautiful. so me and I, and QD3, we don't Quincy have... Quincy Jones, Quincy Delight Jones III, that's who he's talking about. When it right, comes right. Okay. I know him. Because I, 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 uh, I worked on um, 2D3 had a film called Beef, and I helped him on that series. Mm. So he settled it. And I said, good, good. There's no beef. Wow. And, and the reason we had a beef is gone anyway. <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay. Damn, that's the A lot of part of L.A. history, y'all, you know, you're only going to read about when, when DJ Antron I can't it. say it. I cannot say her name. Ooh. Okay. Cherchez <laughs> la femme, they say in France. You know what I'm saying? Hey, Whenever something intriguing, they I, say, look for the woman. There must be a woman involved. Cherchez la femme. How do you know? <laughs> all, you I are young. All, all females that came through the radio tron came through me. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. That that would piss off some people probably, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't care. I don't care. I, I like I started as a battle DJ. I like the battle. Right. That's what I do. Okay. That's what you do. I hate you. <laughs> but well, you moved like, on. Go ahead. Go ahead, my buddy. You want to finish that point? Let's see. Coolio used to come through. Mm. Um, Dr. J and Ed Lover used to come through to the club. Mm. I already said two live crew, but right. Coolio because. Julio looked crazy. We didn't know he was going to be a star. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't change say, much either once he did. <laughs> <laughs> I used to say, that nigga looked crazy. Crazy. <laughs> so, oh. so Radio Tron was kind of like the crossroads of Los Angeles. Not gangster, mm. but hip-hop. Right. Hip-hop, right. There were before, two this is before That's gangster rap anyway. This is before gangster rap anyway, the period we're talking That's right. about. For gangster those of you listening to Right, right. Right, right, right. So there was no so imagery I, about I, that uh, yet. Okay. So I, I saw this. I saw it change. 
I saw how it, the culture changed. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I, I've seen a lot of our people get into that life, and it didn't go good. Okay. Well, you oh. moved on from that. You moved on, yep. and you went into films. I'd like to know now, uh, Mr. Anthony, DJ Antron Maven, exactly about your, your how you transitioned from being a DJ and got into film production and some of the high grossing ass films you've worked on. <laughs> People need to hear that. You had a very interesting life, my brother. Okay. Well, uh, my car got shot up at Ultra Wave hmm. <laughs> over some beef. So I decided <laughs> I, I'm out. I left the street. I said, this, uh, I'm out. Okay. <laughs> that would do it for me but, too, I think. <laughs> <laughs> And again, over a girl, a different one. Mm, 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 mm. I, yeah, and then um, it no, happens. I went to work. It happens. I was a um, recording engineer for Rappers Rap, so I really learned computers. I mean, really learned them on my own right. time. Right. So somehow I got a job working on NASA contracts. Mm. So I did that for a few years. Right when the riots, the L.A. riots dropped. That's 1993. Yeah, yeah. 92, actually, but yeah, same thing. Oh, 92, 93. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. So then I'm working for, um, for NASA, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, all this technology, wouldn't it be cool to use this for films? <laughs> hmm. So that's how I made the switch. So it took me four years. And then the first film, I wanted to work with Arnold Schwarzenegger, so I, I, I did. And then Michael mm. Jackson. Wow. Which one? Well, we did mm. Thriller, too. Wow, man. That's we, as um, deep as you can get. That was for Sony, I, right? Or, or was the Michael so? Jackson himself? Well, no, not, no, no. I'm just saying as far as the entertainment, you know, for, for to work with the top people in the business, Michael Jackson, true. At that Dan time, Win probably. Dan Winston produced it. He's the uh, mm -hmm. creature maker for Jurassic Park, and he has a studio. Mm -hmm. It was Stan Winston put it together. It was, the budget was about a million, two million. Right. I mean, this is big shit, and, and we're inventing the technology because I took – my computer science, you know, I have an honorary uh, PhD in computer science wow. that I taught okay. myself, and I'm a high school dropout at the same time. And you were learning the computer, teaching yourself at a time when they were just coming taught into public. Hmm. Get that. Okay. I taught myself. Got you, brother. That's heavy. So then we did, we did Thriller 2. I mean, it's out. I've posted it lots of times. Uh, mm -hmm. The official title is Ghost, but we right. call it Thriller, too. That's with Michael Jackson. And, you know, I work with Rolling Stones, Macy Gray, mm -hmm. NWA, mm -hmm. Bone Thugs and Harmony, Corrupt, and then so many people I forgot. <laughs> I think we can see a lot of influence uh, in the work that you've done, the hip-hop influence you've injected into the projects you've worked on for people. You know, you put a sensibility, a hip-hop sensibility, which is like a stamp of your creativity in just about everything you, you've done. You've never lost your hip-hop sensibility. And uh, this past summer, we were, uh, it was a great uh, honor for me to work with you for the Radio Tron thing last summer uh, and bring you on board there, bring you back home uh, to the Radio Tron where you began. And I'd like to know what you got planned for the future, man. I know you got something cooking over there, man. Tell us about it. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> I have a, I have a new team I'm building, and the captain, front and center in my team, because I'm the coach, but on the okay. field. Okay. Is Darcy, is Darcy, Darcy Carpenter. You've heard of her. Okay, right, right. She's a friend of Facebook. I remember she got out there and, and, and y'all been talking. Okay, and she's truly talented, huh? 
Right. So she's a model. She's mm-hmm. first of all, she's a ten. So l- okay. let's start with that. <laughs> okay. And, okay. And she's a recording artist, and we're recruiting lots of artists. And we got some artists. We don't want to say their name, but they're big. They're already international right. stars. They've made movies. We uh-huh. have access to everybody, and and she's okay. kind of helping coordinate all this access. So we, we have a, a new team of artists and super producers, mm-hmm. and I'm the coach because I don't want to be on the field. I'm shy. Mm-hmm. I'm behind mm-hmm. the scene. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't I think understand. of this interview. <laughs> well, your experience level actually puts you in the right position to be able to have the uh, that position to be able to sit back and coach because people will right. listen to you. They have respect for what you've done, just like I do, and anybody else who reads your resume. <laughs> so basically, and it's beautiful that we've lived long enough to still be healthy enough to enjoy this level of the entertainment business. You, you and I. Like I, like, you know, like I told you last night. Last mm-hmm. night, Cheryl the Cheryl the Pearl called me, and I had a crush mm-hmm. on her when I was 15 years old. So today I'm like, <laughs> wow. So I'm, I'm pushing people along. I'm like, play her new song. It sounds great. It's good. Um, so I'm going to tell you something, OG. I'm going to tell you something. The show that you're going to okay. be on, she just oh, yeah? agreed to be interviewed. So her interview is going to air on the same show as yours. She's going to hit it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Hey, she I agreed this afternoon to do the interview, so I said we'll make the really? show with her. Yeah, with you, her, and Tron. We have two other guests we may add on, but other than that, right now you and her are confirmed. I think that's going to be July uh, 15th. This July 15th. That's so, that, that is so okay. great. Yeah, it is beautiful. Um, See, this is what I'm saying, man. We're still around years later and still be blessed to be doing something that we both love to do. You know what I'm saying? What do you, I'm going to ask you a question. What do you think of the current state of hip-hop now? I mean, everybody has their opinion on on not just rappers, but the way awards are given out, different aspects of uh, uh, of the business now. That uh, what, what, what do you, is your take on the whole hip-hop? Uh, we know it's a worldwide culture now. But as far as you have what any I views noticed, on... Mm-hmm. What, what I really notice right now is... I wonder who is putting money behind promoting this whatever because I turn on my radio and in my car mm-hmm. and the, the the beats the beats bump they they turn my car out it's like oh these beats are bump <laughs> mm-hmm. but but the rap whatever come mm-hmm. on it it's so bad yeah. it's embarrassing. <laughs> but the beats are good <laughs> yeah yeah so, that, 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 luckily. It's- I just wonder who is putting in money, dumping in mm-hmm. money to promote uh-huh. this. Yeah, exactly. Because it's, it's terrible. Mm-hmm. Do it's you feel so that there's bad. a conspiracy like some people I do. feel? That I do. That's why I said who down. is. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I hear you. Straight up. I hear you. Just like I um, they're saying. Because, come on, man, it's bad. Yeah. yeah it it's really it bad. It is. What happened but, to real music? Okay. What happened to artistry? This stuff, mm-hmm. this, oh, they're promoting it over and over. I hear the same songs over mm-hmm. and over. Like, it's embarrassing to me. Mm-hmm. They're going to make like you said, like I, this song, in other words. They're going to hammer it into your head. <laughs> right. That's and the make you way. like it. But, yeah, exactly. that's a very... That's a very interesting uh, look. A lot of people feel that way also, even down to the way the awards are handed out to uh, uh, skipping over established black artists, not just in hip-hop, but in another musical genre also, to hand out uh, awards to some of the newly created stars, let's say. You know what I'm saying? Like someone is controlling who the next generation of, of this yeah. or that is going to be. You understand what I'm saying? Whereas before, when they were record stores, you made a record, you put it out there, and people came to buy it if they liked it. You, you know what I'm I've saying? I've only heard, I've only heard one song this year I like, and that's Redbone. Hmm. Okay, I'm not everything else. I know Redbone, is, but I haven't. I, oh, okay. That. Redbone. That's number one on um, Billboard's R&B. Gotcha. Wow. <laughs> you, okay. Childish, 
Sam Dino, you heard of it. You know, you know. Number one is right. number one. Okay. But well, did, did Migos barely pass a little bit? But ugh, even Drake sounds like shit now. <laughs> I guess once they get up there, they don't feel they have to work as hard. They can release something with their name on it and it's going to sell a million units. You know what I'm saying? Until the word gets around that it's bumped or whatever. You see what I'm saying? A lot of artists get to that level where they can sell a certain amount of units just on their name. You know? You know, I, but, I, I they, they talk to the president of Motown, Al Bell. Whoever's mm-hmm. pushing this stuff can make anything a hit. Mm-hmm. Because they put it in the lane. So I'm like, who is pushing this? Who is pushing mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Not right. Mm-hmm. You know, you put a third in the fast lane, and that's a number one. I mean, mm. when they blocked Prince, Prince had 30 number one songs on Emancipation when they blocked him. Mm. You see, now that was pure quality. But today, uh, I don't know. DJ Antron, if your children, any one of your children was telling you they wanted to get into the music business right now, what would be the advice you would give them? My um, 17-year-old daughter, she's creating new music. She's, she's gifted and talented. So she's going to make new creations. And I'm, I, I, I give her the tools. I bought her all the uh, equipment she needed. Mm-hmm. So she's being creative, you know what I'm saying? She's still in wow. high school. But she's, okay. she's making new stuff. Right. And right. she's doing spoken word, which is it's not rap, but you know what I'm saying. She's yeah, being creative. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So she might she might create something. Who knows? I would like I need to hear something new. <laughs> I got you. I got you. But you have no reservations. You wouldn't tell her, well, I don't think show business is a good thing to get into or anything like that. Um you have a that ba- basically a balanced view of the whole thing. No, all my kids are in college for for you know, my my oldest, she's twenty three, she's going for her PhD in psychology. To answer your question, that's going to be a side thing. The first thing, ah. get your education, get your career, and get be solid. There because you, you cannot wish on a hope. Because <laughs> it's not guaranteed. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you've heard years of wisdom talking to my audience out there from Mr. Anthony, DJ Antron Maven, what he just said is the result and accumulation of years of experience in this business. My brother, we want to thank you for everything you've done in hip-hop. You're one of the most unheralded, unsung forces behind a lot of the popular uh, music that uh, emerged from old school L.A. And uh, I want to thank you, and I want to thank you for doing my program, being gracious enough to introduce me to your sister, who is the producer of the program and who is a That's one right. in herself. <laughs> she is a world into herself. Yes, a genius for what she does. So I feel like I'm with family right now. She's sitting here and I'm on the phone with her brother. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's been a beautiful interview. And uh, my brother, I want to wish you a blessed day. I wish I had another half an hour to spend with you, but you know how radio is. Okay? But I love you, DJ Thank and you so much. And I want to wish you the best. And anything that you do, you got this for daddy support. Thank you so much. Thank you, my brother. Peace and blessings. We out, y'all. Disco Daddy's wide world of hip hop. Vibes Lives has something very special for you right after church. Gospel brunch and sunshine. I am Robin Lynn, and join me for Jazz with Jay every Sunday and a glass of wine (laughs) on VibesLive.com. 12 noon Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hello out there, Disco Daddy here. Welcome to Disco Daddy's wide world of hip-hop. And today, we've really all been blessed. We've been blessed with the presence of a man who goes way back to the beginning on the west coast of uh, the um, 
beginning of hip hop recording, and uh, he's known as Mellow Man Ace. How you doing oh. today, my brother? Yo, yo, that's a great intro. I appreciate it. I'm doing well. But, I, you know, I won't say I was here in the beginning. I'll say maybe not not day one, but day two for sure. Okay. You was day one. Well, we... You was day one. I'm a day two. But, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, we're going to let you break it down because this is what we're going to do. We're going to let you talk about your early days where you were born and grew up. And what influenced you to go into uh, music and basically what Mellow Man Ace is all about. So start with your earliest recollections where you were born and grew up. Yeah. Mellow Man Ace on Disco Daddy's Wide World of Hip Hop. No doubt. Um, I was born in Pinat de Rio, Cuba, um, in, in Cuba, of course, uh, 1967. Um migrated, my family migrated after I won the Cuban lottery to leave the island uh, in 1971. Uh, wow. Spent small time on the East Coast. Of course, we were claimed in Miami by a family member that was already here. He took us mm-hmm. into Jersey, and then uh, my parents chose the relocation of Los Angeles based off the weather and that the ground only shook once every 20 years. So um, we've wow. been in L.A. ever since. Um, my earliest recollection to music has to be my grandfather, who I'm named after, uh, Upiano Reyes. He was a mm-hmm. great composer in Cuba. He composed the Cuban National Anthem and about 16 danson rhythms on the wow. island um, that were famously re-recorded by other artists as the years went on. And that's my earliest recollection of music because my father um, used to write his notes for him as my grandfather didn't know how to write music, but he could play it. So my father would translate his lyrics onto the sheets. I'm sorry, not the lyrics, the notes. And, the music, um, yeah. The music. So that was my earliest recollection, seeing my father writing on this line paper, these funny little <laughs> notes and whatnot. But... Um, yeah, and then when we got to the States, I, I, you know, we were heavily influenced, you know, as I started to realize and come of age around seven or eight years old, you know, we would hear, you know, the Isley Brothers and Steely Dan on the radio and uh, the Jackson 5 and, uh, of course, LTD and all those groups, you know, um, and later right. on really starting to understand what it all meant, you know. Of course, even Elvis Presley, we would hear those records. Um, uh, You know, there were so many influences. You're talking about, you know, one of the most important eras of music was in the 70s, and you had so many things going on. You had everything from the Led Zeppelins to Ohio Players and, you know, of course, Parliament and Cameo as they came in, and and you would start to really hear these records. But that's that's my earliest recollections of, of music. And I think in sixth grade, uh, the tallest girl in the class, her name was Madre Cross, she invited There's me. There's always a girl in the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, ahead, Madre always... Cross uh, invited me to dance at a, at a school dance, and I was able to finally, you know, show her what my older sister Myra had taught me on the dance floor. And huh. um, I believe... Um, Man, if I'm correct, it had to be one of those um, Isley Brothers songs. I, I forget if it was Who's That Lady or, um, or uh, I'm sorry, I'm um, drawing a blank here. It had to be Fight Who's the That power, Lady. The power, one of the up-tempo. Yeah, it was. Well, I got work song. to do. I got work to do. Mm-mm. Okay, but it was up tempo rock and eyes recently. Yeah, yeah. To make a long mm-hmm. story short, but mm-hmm. yeah, no doubt. That's pretty much it. That's the beginning. You know what I mean? It where where I started to but really understand the game, But what what happened? Well, yeah. I mean, we were innocent kids at that time in the seventies. It was sixth grade. You know, so nothing happened after that. We be oh no, you were just mentioning friends. that was the. That was the musical influences that were around you at the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, and, you know, you started to discover everything else after that. What happened to make you decide at what point did, were you drawn into this new uh, developing music, uh, which later became known as hip-hop? In the beginning, there was no name on it, but uh, guys and girls were rapping. There were a few groups. What groups were around at the time you, you entered into uh, uh, the culture? Well, the beautiful thing for me, growing up 1,500 miles or however far it is to the Bronx, New York, I remember there was a kid who moved, what is it, 3,000 miles from here to the East Coast, right? There was a kid who came to school who had just moved from New York, Italian kid by the name of Carmine Chalace. He was the first kid I saw with a boombox, even though, you know, everybody was doing it. I was doing right. it boombox. In South Central, I didn't grow up in South Central. I grew right. up in a city called Southgate. And in Southgate, okay. this kid, Carm, came to school with a boombox one day, and he was playing two records that I'll never forget. One was Rapid Delight, and the other one was something by Curtis Blow. Could have been the breaks. The year was like 1979. Right. In 79, he did this in junior high school, and I was like, wow, what is that? And then he... He was eight. He was really dope at Electric Boogaloo, and I've never seen that. Okay. So that's uh. like the first virus that I caught for hip-hop. Right. Mm. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't start doing it later until I started writing lyrics in English class in high school, um, which the fascination of putting words together and the way definitions of words really intrigued me in high school I used to love to be the first one to finish my definitions and beat everybody else mm. in the class. And I think that that started the fascination for writing. And it had to be like 1982-ish, 83-ish in there. But by okay. that time, we were listening to records like Sucker MCs and, you know, right. stuff like that. Uh, early UTFO stuff uh, and records like that. Of course, you know... Um, we had, I believe, Toddy T and the Bataram and them were coming in. Bataram, yeah. And we were, you know, of course, um, well, World Class Wrecking Crew. And those are mm -hmm. the records that, you know, now in the 80s I started to listen to with Egyptian Lover and all those guys. Okay. And for me it was because I was kind of slow coming from another country to learn the language, I couldn't make the grade to play sports and I was a really good pitcher. So mm -hmm. luckily for me, hip hop came along, which then my father connected by telling me, of course, again, my grandfather's connection to music, my uncle, who I'm also named after, he's also a musician. His kids are all musicians. And so it all made perfect sense when I stopped playing baseball yeah. to just go into break dancing and b boying as my entry-level position in hip-hop. Okay. So you were B-boy first before I'm you started rapping. Absolutely. 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 We used to go to Venice Beach, 83, 84. My older, my older homeboy, Cuban Chad, that had also moved from New York to here, to L.A., Robert Rodriguez hmm. would put us, you know, in his little car and take the conga drums down up to uh, Venice Beach for a walk. I'd lay out the cardboard, and he would play the congas with his boy Skilo in them, and wow. and I would be the b boy, and then we generate you know money on the on the uh, on the boardwalk and stuff like that, and right. and have right. a good right. old time. But that's how we. Okay. That was my entry, really. You know, like catching the virus full fledged. Hmm. Okay, at some point, Mellow Man Ace picks up a microphone. And yeah. the rest is history. How did that happen? Um, I was writing rhymes in, in high school, like I said, and in my neighborhood there was two Cuban clubs, right, mm -hmm. uh, usually where the elders would get together on the weekends and they would dance salsa and stuff like that. Well, one year they decided to let the kids have a little something, and one of the other kids brought some turn tape. Huh. And um, it was the club called the Oguinetto down on California Street in Southgate where I really picked up the first mic. 
Um, what year? There. What year this is it? This was 1985 now, 85, 84. Okay. Um, yeah, I, w- I would say 85. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I started by rapping in Spanish. I had this real dirty uh, Spanish rap that I had wrote. <laughs> it had right. no bar structure. It, it didn't have no hook or nothing. It was just right. at that time we were just battling. So the rhyme was really more of a battle style rhyme in all Spanish. Okay. But by that time I had heard records like the Mean Machine Disco Dream. Mm-hmm. which is where a, a classic hip-hop record on Sugar Hill Records, which one of the MCs by the name of Mr. Schick broke off into a like an eight-bar Spanish rap. And I remember thinking mm-hmm. to myself, one day I'm going to be like that guy. Except okay. so, so back then, remember, you couldn't just bite, right? So right. I said, I'm going to take that little piece and add on to it and make my own originality. So I wrote a, a, a whole song. And then uh, later on, I would create the bilingual rhyme style that became notorious. Wow. wow. Okay. So you pick up a microphone, you start rapping. Um, eventually, you either get discovered. How did you start to you first record your first record? Well, uh, I, you know, I'm moving a little ahead. So the first time I would say okay. I picked up a microphone, in a professional setting, was uh-huh. at the original Radiotron with the legend and the great master teacher. For me, Tony G was on the turntable. After wow. I had honed my skills battling in Southgate and Linwood, Huntington Park, and Bell, somebody had invited us to go up the Radiotron. It, it was this, myself. This had to be, what, 83, 84, or 85, just yeah, before right. they closed. Mm-hmm right before they closed. Um, ah, and it was myself, okay. a rapper by the name of Chili Chill, who later would mm-hmm. become and change his name to Be Real of Cypress huh. Hill. And I that remember it was myself and and at that time Chili Chill. Um, we went there and Tony G was on the decks and we began to write, you know, the, to bust on the mic. And I remember we had a we were so rookie. We uh, <laughs> I, the way I like to tell it is, Chili Chill missed his cue on the beginning of the rap like two times, uh-huh. and we had to start the whole thing over. You know what I mean? Oh. It was a good <laughs> right. old day. It was a good old day, man. Before you right, know, yeah, was, still you know, having everything. fun. Yeah. And so, you know, Tony G was great. He he never said, "Hey, man, get you know, get the hell off the stage. Y'all not ready." He never <laughs> said that. And I think. <laughs> Um, that would come back into play later on, five years later or so. I'm sorry, like three years later or so. And I thought nothing of it. We went there. We felt chilly, chill, be real, whatever you want to call them at that time, right? Right, Um, right. We felt, you know, we went home disappointed because, you know, we had to start the song three times. You know what I mean? So I continued continued on my quest. Uh, My my man... um, be real, at that time, he he kind of gave up on it. He kind of gave up on it, mm. and he went and started hanging out in South Central. But I continued and believed in myself that I would make it somehow, some way, someday, you know? Right on. Right on. And so the great master Tony G, years later, um, I met a guy by the name of Kid Frost who had been rapping in all English. He was a Latino kid. Mexican, mm-hmm. Chicano, but he hadn't mm-hmm. written in Spanish yet at that time. He was he had a record wow. called The Terminator out at that time. He was mm-hmm. uh, he had a good reputation out on the street, you know, and right. he would right. rock with Handyman and those guys and and Ice T and them dudes, you know, at that time. So, right. um, I forget. I, I believe it was Julio G. DJ Julio G. The mix master who also went to my high school, who introduced me then to later on to Tony G in a formal way. Oh, I was like, okay. yo, that's crazy because I told Tony <laughs> that day when I met him for real with Julio, I said, you were the DJ that was spending the day that me and, and, and Be Real was at Radio John. Mm-hmm. So then 
that's when it all started to make sense because as I then got my first record deal on Delicious Vinyl in 87, 88, Tony G, I went to to be the producer of the track. Wow. The tracks, you see. Okay. So okay. that's how it all came together. And, and to, it was Tony G, the great, I call him the great master teacher. He's the one that really showed me how to write in bar structure, what's a hook, what's, you know, what is two bars, what is eight bars, what is 16 bars. Wow. All these things, wow. I had no idea what I was doing. Right. All I knew is that I had a record to make. And you know, I was I was lucky at that time to be in the right place at the right time. At the right time, is Tony T still around? Tony G is still around. He's still That's around. Right. Um, he has a studio in El Monte, and and he's doing his thing. And he's he he puts on some type of scratch act, academy school and and things of that nature. So yeah. Okay, so now at what point in your career? Did you adopt the name Mellow Man Ace, and where did that come from? No doubt. Um, Mellow Man Ace came from a cipher we had on Cypress Hill Avenue um, in South mm. at the time. And mm. uh, remember, we used to walk around with a little tape recorder with the mini cassettes in them, right? So <laughs> yeah, one, right. Night, <laughs> one night, we're getting blizzied out, you know, 40s and, and whatever, and somebody mm. started banging a beat on a car, on a car hood. And it was myself, mm. my brother, who at that time, his name was Haji Sheik. Y'all might know him as Sand Dog of Cypress Hill. He was a wow. really big Egyptian lover fan at that time, so he called himself Haji Sheik, right? So it was myself. Right. At that time, I went by the uh, the rapper Ace Cool because I was mm. starting to be a big LL Cool J fan and anything cool, okay. DJ Cool, Red Alert, all that stuff. <laughs> Right. So now, I what year? What year? What, what, what year is this happening? What year is this happening? Now we're talking about. Now we're talking about eighty six, beginning of eighty seven gotcha. in there. Okay. Right. Okay. So we're one night we just getting blizzied out in the hood. Somebody start banging a car, and but my boy, whose his name is Tomahawk Funk, a funk dubious. Tyrone <laughs> also yeah. grew up with us, right? Wow. So he starts busting the rap, and he says, "I'm chilling with." Oh, you know what? Send Dog's name had already evolved from Haji Sheik to Down Rock. Okay. So wow. now he okay. says, Tyrone says, I'm chilling on the street with Down Rock and my mellow man Ace. Okay, <laughs> I thought nothing of it. I thought nothing right. of it. Because if you remember at that time, if you if you had a homeboy, that was your mellow. Okay. All right? Now we're talking about okay. East Coast principal, you know, hip-hop right. type of thing, right? So if somebody right. was your homeboy, oh, yo, that's my mellow Larry, or that's my mellow boy, Yo, my mellow, yeah, yeah, I remember. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yes. Yes. I thought nothing of it, but the next morning, I woke up and I said, man, well, let me play and see what we did, you know, off the cassette. Mm -hmm. So then I'm listening to the whole cypher, and, and we're all gathered around listening to what we had did while we was faded, you know? Mm. And my man says, my mellow man, Ace. And I'm like, mellow man, Ace, that sounds cool. <laughs> you know, remember, because a lot of MCs had the three names at that time. You had Cool Mo D, Big Daddy right. King. You see what I'm saying? Right. So it made a lot of sense, LL Cool J, you know. What were you I'm calling saying? yourself? What were you calling yourself up to that point? I was calling myself Ace Cool. Ace Cool, okay. Ace okay. Cool. But then I heard okay. that just roll off off the tongue on on the cassette, and I'm like, "Mellow Man Ace, that sounds kind of hard." You got a, you got a rhythm know, to it, yeah. They got a rhythm to it, and I <laughs> just went ahead and rolled with it. Okay, okay. Now, me and you had a conversation about uh, the Latino uh, music culture as far as hip hop. Uh, uh, you use the term a subculture within a subculture. Uh, let's talk about that for a minute on your take on uh, the development, first of all. You can't tell. I don't know too much about the East Coast. Well, I do now because of my interviews. But I know the development of West Coast uh, hip-hop. You cannot leave out Latino influence and Latino pioneers when you mention Kid Frost and yourself. 
but you use the term of a subculture within a subculture when we were referring to of uh, Latinos in hip hop. Uh, did you yeah. mean that when just a West Coast uh, 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 anomaly, or did you mean that in, in music in general, uh, as far as hip hop is concerned, that you view I, it as a subculture well, within a subculture? Why don't, I'm gonna let you yeah, explain it, what you would like. Like I say, yeah, it's a culture within a subculture. It's a subculture within mm-hmm. a culture, right? And okay. so, when you think about when you think about hip hop in its early stages of the early 80s, late 70s to early 80s, you had the Puerto Rican element and there were some Cuban kids in there as well. You have DJs like Charlie Chase, uh, my fellow okay. brother, fellow Cuban, DJ Disco Wiz. You had Prince right. Whipple Whip. You had Ruby right. and of the of, of the Romantic Fantastic Five. And you had mm. several others like Mr. Schick of the Mean Machine. Mm-hmm. So I grew up off these records. However, none of them really, other than Mr. Schick, rapped in Spanish. So those were my early mm. influences, right? So I said, okay. I'm at the turn of the time when you started to hear Fight the Power and Public Enemy being proud to be black, I said, mm. well, I'm proud to be Latino, too. Right. I'm, I'm Afro and Latino. So right. I was like, okay, when I get my shot, I'm going to put it out there. Just be proud of you, too. You could do this, right. too. And and then as I did the knowledge on hip-hop, I discovered all these other Latino elements and beat boys who were there at the inception of the creation of the culture. And so I said, mm-hmm. this makes perfect sense. However, it wasn't until a press day at Capitol Records after I had left Delicious Vinyl and went to Capitol mm-hmm. Records, a brother by the name, a journalist, I should say, by the name of Soren Baker, who at the time wrote for The Source, did an mm-hmm. interview with me on press day. And he mm-hmm. says this, and I quote, he starts his interview mm-hmm. by saying, so how does it feel to be the godfather of Latino hip-hop? Ha. Boom. My electric electricity light, my Einstein moment comes happens once there. Wait, what year? What year were we talking now that that happened? Well, now, well, now we're talking. Moment. I was already successful, so we talk in '91 during that Nine, okay. that press day. Okay, okay this gotcha. was after I had already created the bilingual rhyme style known as Spangler. Mm-hmm. But he Spangler. and we'll take it back. We'll take it back a little bit in a minute. Yeah. But it, I think okay. it's worth saying here that it was Soren Baker who coined it, not myself. And you know, right. as in this hip hop thing. It's vital that sometimes you find a niche. Yes? Can we agree? Yes. Yes, yes I do. You have to find your niche, uh, right. as they say. And so I found my niche there and decided to run with it, even though creating the style, the bilingual rhyme style, was really the niche first. And we'll get into that okay. and how that style came about, I'm sure. Okay. Okay. Now, does that limit you? As far as your commercially, uh, uh, with the record companies, did they, uh, you have any problems with them wanting to, you to be more commercial and, and just not just have a, a, a niche style? Was there pressure on you to, in other words, open up and go with the flow where hip hop seemed to be going at that time? Because what you did, when we look back on it, is revolutionary, actually. <laughs> Okay. Um, that. That's heavy. At that, yes, it was because at that time I remember, and only the OGs do remember, that hip hop was popping everywhere by that time, and there was really no looking at color per se or or race, but it was there, in the sense that you know when you when somebody got up on the stage they say oh he's Latino, but no nobody ever judged you by that. They judged by what you spit. Yes. You see what I'm saying? So by you taking Absolutely. it to another level and rapping in two languages, what kind of reception, first of all, did you get from audiences? Well, obviously, that, that you had a niche audience. But basically, when people saw you for the, for the first time, they'd never seen you. What, what, what was it like for seeing Mellow Man Ace in, from your perspective? perspective yeah, most definitely. You know, you know what, I'm, what I'm getting at at that time? How was your style accepted? 
No doubt, no doubt. And, and I think here it's worth saying that I can't skip over the importance of those struggle years there between 85 to 87, 88, where we would be, I would be playing. I'll speak for myself in this sense here. Uh, I would mm-hmm. be playing the ASCAP showcase with, with you know, uh, showcases with Greg Mack hosting, Lisa Canning, and, and, and of course, Curtis wow. Harmon and those guys. Um, you know, those years were vital because it was there that I started to hone my presentation skills. You see, ah, now I'm, I'm I'm playing these these tough crowds in South Central LA and all crip neighborhoods or all blood mm-hmm. neighborhood, and you had to show mm-hmm. and prove, right? right? So as a right. black Latino, as a black Latino, at first, black folk was like, "Oh hell no, we don't understand that." However, however. The Latinos in the crowd were wilding out. Right. You see, so it right. was a 50 50 mixed response. Black folks, okay. of course, the other 50% of me was like, we don't really get it. I guess it's cool, but uh, whatever. Who's next? Right, right, right. right. Latinos was wilding out. So then the hmm. judges and Rory Kaufman and all these people, Greg Mack, were wowed by the, the mm-hmm. Spanish delivery, right? So I would win a lot of those contests because I was different. Different. It was my own difference that made me acceptable, in other Mm -hmm. words. Mm -hmm. So so then I think what happened was Delicious Vinyl caught wind of it, and they they, – one day I found myself in a studio – with DJ Muggs of Cypress Hill, who was recording a track for the movie Colors called Why with a group mm-hmm. 7A3, and I happened to go to the studio that day. And so Delicious Vinyl says to me, hey, we just signed a guy by the name of Tone Loke and another guy named Young MC. We're looking for rappers to sign. I'm like, I rap. I rap in Spanish too. And they were like, wow. Spanish? Let, wow. let us hear something. And so I started mm-hmm. busting that same dirty little rap I told you a while back. <laughs> All right. And they was like, stop, stop. You sound like the Latino LL Cool J out this smug. You know Man. what I mean? So Man. they said, why don't you come back tomorrow? we put you on some tracks and see what you sound like. Man, I came back mm-hmm. the next day. I one take jaked it. It was that long 87 rap, 87 bar rap with those hooked up and they just loved it so they broke the thing up. Man. They brought in Tony G to break down the mm. verses mm. and then and then we put it out. Now that's when Latinos all over because it you know, we ended up taking it to the comp to swap meet the sloths and swap meet and, you know, right. all these other things, the podium with Mr. Steve Yano down there, rest in peace. And then okay. that's when the Latino culture just broke the hell up like, oh shit. What year was that released? Now we're talking about 1987, 88 in there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, give us, give us a little history on Delicious Vinyl. Yeah, uh, Delicious Vinyl was uh, started by Matt Dykes, Michael Ross, and Michael Ross, who at that time were calling themselves the Dust Brothers on the production mm-hmm. tip. It mm-hmm. was just two two white boys who later I found out were Jewish, actually, right? And (laughs) they were just starting this thing out of this little, uh, uh, on top of an appliance store down on Melrose Ave, I believe it was, or Santa Monica Boulevard, right? One of those. I I forget Mm -hmm. what street it was on. And and they, I ended up there that day, but Delicious Vinyl was key in believing in Spanish rap as the first label that, that really wow. stepped to the forefront and said, we want to put this out. Wow. And, of course, okay. you know, everybody knows the Dust Brothers who then produced for the Beastie Boys and, you know, and, and they would do stuff with Rick right. Rubin and all those guys. Right. And you went from there to Capitol. What was the reason that uh, the relationship dissolved with Delicious? Yes. No, it, did, it never did. Actually, and to this oh, day, we're okay. very good friends, and I, I was just with them down uh, on the weekend. Here's how that happened. Wow. Uh, 
Delicious Vinyl sets up a concert at San Diego State University for myself, Tone Loke, I believe Young MC was there, and a legend from New York by the name of Tila Rock. And at that time, uh-huh. Tila Rock had two dancers with him by it's the name yours. of Nice and Smooth. Yes. Right. Okay. The right. big record was It's Yours, of course. It's Yours. Uh-huh. Uh, paragraph expert. Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's yours. yours. So we go down yeah. there. Yeah, so we go down there, San Diego State. We swear we're going to rock it. We're going to kill it, and, <laughs> you know, and it's going to be crazy. It's going to be, man, we made it, you know, we, our first big mm-hmm. concert, you know. Man, we mm-hmm. get there that night, man, San Diego State University. It was 10 people in the in the, in the the whole concert hall. <laughs> 10 people. But like my mom's always, at that time, you know, I had Cypress Hill was my dancers. And mm. and and the legend Keela Rock had nice and smooth as his dancers. Mm-hmm. DJ Muggs was my DJ at that time. So mm. we go in there, and I remember I just hearing my mother's voice who always used to tell me and my brother, you give a 100% whether it's one person or a thousand. She always or a thousand. That. That's right. Yes, the show must go on. Okay. Yeah, the show must go on. So I go on stage. Mm. And I give it 110. My whole crew does. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So we kill it. After that set, I'm standing at the back of the hall watching Tone Lope perform. And that's when a man came up to me by the name of Kenny Ortiz. He had a business card in his hand, and he said, hey, look, I'm Kenny Ortiz, Capitol Records representative. Capitol Records had me come down here to San Diego, check out your show, and let you know we want to give you a record deal. Wow. Like, Whoa, wait a wow. minute. Wait a minute. Uh-huh. There's only 10 people here, and the ninth person is the representative of Capitol Records. Uh-huh. Well, I'm tripping. <laughs> yeah. I'm tripping because I had already signed with Delicious Vinyl. So I tell this man, I said, well, I'm already signed to Delicious Vinyl. He goes, don't worry about that. We're going to buy out the contract. Wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. They wanted back to LA. They wanted Mellow Man Ace. They, they wanted, wanted Mellow Man. Man is shit. Yes, pardon my friend. <laughs> right. So right. as we get right. back to LA the following week, I call the man. Mm-hmm. He sets everything up, and and I come to find out that he too was Afro Cuban. <laughs> How Ortiz, great is that? Last name Ortiz. How That's a lot of no name, but he was right. he looked like a Stone Cold <laughs> brother. You see? <laughs> so he was just like me, Afro-Latino. He was already within right. the gates of the infrastructure at Capitol and understood the vision. Gotcha. So then the talks gotcha. began with Delicious Vinyl and Capital. Capital, I believe, offered them somewhere around 45000 to buy out my contract. And because mm. Delicious Vinyl needed the money to make more records on Tone Loke and Young MC, it made perfect right. sense. Right? Okay. Because they couldn't keep okay. up with their demand at that time. Right. So now they right. got a fresh 45K to press up more tone low and young MC. I then okay. venture off the Capitol, and that's when I created the bilingual rhyme style known as the bilingual, you know, the uh, the Spangler stuff when I started Spangler. doing the, the first album, which, of course, I went right to Tony G, the, the master teacher, to produce it. Mm-hmm. Now, how were the sales on that worldwide? I don't want to just know the, the United States sales because what you're doing, obviously, there are millions of people. Did they do a worldwide distribution? You were capital. I assume that they did. What, what kind of? How was the uh, Spanglish accepted? Yes, indeed. If you remember correctly, Capital had a Latino division by the name of EMI. Mm-hmm. EMI was brought in to service it in Latin America. And they sure did. Right. And we ended up doing over two million in sales worldwide. Man, man, I have the that black is here a, a record. <laughs> that have, you had to establish a record for a Latino artist in hip hop at that time. I'm sure. Well, yeah. I mean, it wasn't the norm being that th- these records of mine, the the first one, the dirty Spanish rap, and then uh, when you talk about Mentirosa, that really set the standard and opened the door for Latinos on a bigger level because I never closed that door behind me, you see. And so right. then by then, you know, we got to see Kid Frost started to rap 
and got with Tony G and started to rap in bilingual format as well with me uh, in okay. our camp, right? Yeah. So then, right. of course, that opens the door for Cypress Hill. Then later, a, a year or two after, and then they dropped, you know, how I could just kill a man, and the rest was history on that. But then yeah. Lighter Shade of Brown was able to get in. You see what I'm saying? Little by little, then we so, started to hear Fat Joe and Big Pun and all these other guys come through. So you were the pioneer, the foundation of all of that, although not many people will point at it and, and say that, but I'm going to say it uh, because well, obviously what you did reverberated throughout the Latino community, which had embraced uh, hip-hop from the beginning, as we all know. But you're well, you know what? I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a prideful dude like that. I'm gonna always give props to the one and only Mr. Shit of the Mean Machine. He's the one that really showed me my future. Wow. Um, okay. That little Spanish rap piece and that one song toward the end, I saw mm-hmm. a bigger picture. So I give the credit to Mr. Shit. There are people okay. who don't know who this man is. He was a great Puerto Rican rapper out of the Bronx. Mm-hmm. And he deserves his props and his credit. I'm just the one that took it global first. Okay. Mellow Man Ace, what would you like the world to know about you? And what are you working on now? We've got about uh, two minutes to wrap this up. But I want to know what your current projects are. Uh, I know you got a release out. And what does the future hold for Mellow Man Ace? Okay. Man, you know, to be honest with you, um, um, I just I'm very approachable. Um, just want the fans to know I'm very approachable. I'm very humble. I've had my moments in life that have given me my humble pie and I and I I'm thankful for those lows as well as all the highs and I think they've helped to make me a well rounded man. So just know that I'm approachable. I've never shunned from an interview or a, a autograph or a photo op from anybody. So if you see me, go ahead and approach me. I'm a cool dude. You know, I stay humble. Um, what I'm working on right now, realistically, at this particular mm-hmm. time, is nothing. I'm not writing mm-hmm. right now. Uh, I do okay. have some projects out. As, as uh, Last year, I put out a record called So Rough, So Tough that did really well for me on the underground level, um, especially okay. at Sirius Radio. Um, you know, radio can be a very complicated realm. Um, yeah. But we try not to play that game anymore. Uh, and, mm. you know, in return for spins, you got to then pay it back out of your royalties and all these other things that occur there. But, you know, uh, and I just recently, I, I, I will say I gave, it, it wasn't really a release. I wrote a song called Divine Thoughts, and I shot a video for it, and I never released it. I just put it out through my YouTube channel for those who are subscribers of my music to have this as a gift because the song is really Mm. deep. And after, you know, uh, Donald Trump took office, I got very depressed and I needed to, I needed to get it off my chest. So I wrote this piece called divine thoughts and it's my gift to the world. Um, and that's out right now on only YouTube. It was never released. I never asked anybody to buy it. This is just like, you know, when you have so many hip-hop legends passing on right now, mm-hmm. I felt like, okay, oh, yeah. how are you going to be remembered? And, I, and if ah. I drop dead today or tomorrow, whatever, because no man is talked no other day, right? I, I want people right. to go back and say, man, he was trying to leave us something. Ah. He died that's for hip-hop. And, and that's really that's it. I'm in, I'm in that part of my life where I'm just trying to drop legacy bars. And if it has right. no importance and it's shallow-minded or ratchet or, or, you know, I'm not doing it. I already did those yeah. records 25, 26 years ago. Now as a grown huh. man, you know what I mean, it's important that I leave mm-hmm. a legacy for my son and he can see that I, if I died today, I died for hip-hop and I left the world. Okay. Something. That's it, man. That's it. Now, is there, are there outlets, however, where people can go and purchase your music? Absolutely. Um, you can always go on, on iTunes and all those Spotify guys and, and find, mm-hmm. you know, those early works and you can find those middle works as well, the ones that right. never hit popular radio. Um, mm-hmm. and, and there's a lot of great material, I feel, you know, like 
that I that I've left on these catalogs. You know, um, my last album, which I put out, I want to say it was a year and a half ago, called mm-hmm. uh, "The Lost Decade," has a lot of gems mm-hmm. in that one. And the album that is a real sleeper that I feel I did my absolute best work on, Restoring Order, um, is out there as well. Look for those for those who are purists and love real music without the fluff mm-hmm. and the hoopla of mainstream <laughs> media. Find those right. records because I've left you a lot of gems. Hmm. Wow. Mellow Man Ace, we want to thank you for your contribution to hip-hop. We want to thank you for your time coming to do this show. And we want to wish you the best, my brother. And whatever you do, we know it's going to be creative bomb. Mellow Man Ace, blessings to you, my brother. Thank you very much. Much love and respect. You've been listening to Mellow Man Ace, hip-hop pioneer, on Disco Daddy's wide world of hip-hop. Don't go away. We've got more guests coming up. And we're going to explore this worldwide culture that we call hip-hop, a culture that we all love. Thank you. The song wasn't in a great show. Come back next week, every Saturday at 1 p.m. Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Central Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Disco Daddy's Wide World of Hip Hop Show. Man, it's a great one. Epic, epic. See you next week. Bye. Hey, what's going on? You know what I'm saying? This is Grand Bukacha right now. You know what I'm saying? Mr. Clean Cut put together. Oh, man, you got to wait till you hear this, man. It's called Vibes Live number three. Theme song. Man, he got down and done it right, man. I'm saying, because I'm listening to it, and I'm like, damn. Come on, what the hell? Over here breaking records up again. Yeah, yeah. Bob, Bob, Robin, Lynn, maybe. Got you playing again. Playing With again. With the notion to win, win. Gotta win. get you playing every single day like, hey. hey. We over here and we doing it again. Huh? Huh? Popping for the top. DJ time to spin. Time to spin. Bob, Bob, character surprise. And the world vibe. Straight for that exercise. Best talk radio of 2014. 2014. Robin Lynn, maybe. On the big Big screen, music, Florida, representing, Mac Capital, records, fingerprinting, Mac Capital, life, indenting, angel session, gospel sensation, talking all in blessings, fly away with Tamika Trayvon, now you got to hear this, hot up off the press, Bob's live is out, it's out, sparking interest, young Chi-Town, Chi-Town, Ike Ellis, Southeast 360 Music and Jerry Royce Live. You got to hear this. Hear this. Willie Brown. And let's not forget about Freedom Doors and Ministry. Freedom Doors and Ministry. I am Vibes Live. Two fingers up. Clean cut surprise. No surprise. I do this for everybody. Honest guys. We over here breaking records of the year. Oh, yeah. Vibes Live. Robin Lynn. Maybe. Got you playing again. 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 For the top, DJ time to spin, to spin. Live, live, character surprise And the world vibes Straight for that exercise Yo, I step up and say step what's up, up. My what's name up? is Clean Cut what As up? I throw my two fingers up You say I'm so cool so I cool. got it, vibes live, so full so Everybody cool. say I'm sitting on a stool And I'm spinning, but then I'm winning And then I'm taking over swimming And pimping, but you know I ain't lynching Keep it off the one time, forgot to mention Keep it going, freestyle pension Everybody got to get a beat, get a beat. I keep it real up in the game And I'm smiling, smiling with my with teeth my They looking so bright I stopped the smoking Stop the smoking, I stop see. the drinking, stop see. the drinking, but I'm see. sober. See, sober, I keep see. it real up in the game. They call me OG. OG, OG gets crazy when I'm lyrically, lyrically up in the game. Got you feeling like insanity. Got you over now. You wanna see triple me triple X to be? Everybody wanna come and try to be beat me. Uh, we over here breaking records of the year. Uh, yeah. Bye bye, Robin Lynn, maybe. Got you playing again. Playing again. With the notion to win. Hey, we over here and we doing it again. Popping for the top, DJ 
DJ Timeless, 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 Tim